The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello, my name is Patty Hunter. Welcome to my TV show, Patty's Page. Today, let us welcome our special guest here in our home studio, Christopher Elliott, a writer and high school history teacher. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, good it's nice day. to be here. <laughs> Have I got questions for you? So, uh, Hold up the book and see what we're going to be talking about, eh? It's called Before the Dream and what happened here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So, Chris, where were you born and raised? Born and raised right here in Fort Wayne. I'm a lifelong resident. And while growing up, who influenced you the most? My parents certainly influenced me, and um, I would say some other family members, my grandparents in particular. Mm -hmm. As a kid, what did you first notice about your society that you were living in in Fort Wayne? I noticed a lot. Um, I noticed Fort Wayne, despite being a relatively large city, had almost a small town feel to it. There seemed to be a sense of family. Um, Notice some economic differences, notice some racial differences, oh. spiritual differences, and we seem to be a relatively diverse community. Like a mounting pot or something like that? Yes. What schools did you go to get your education in? Okay. Um, I attended Harrison Hill Elementary School, Miami mm -hmm. Middle School, and graduated from Wayne High School. And then went to several different colleges for degrees. Mm -hmm. um, have a business degree that I earned from Indiana Wesleyan a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And then my teaching degree is from IPFW. So uh, <clears throat> you majored basically in what topic was your favorite? What was my favorite subject in school? I would say both English and history have interested me ever since I was a young kid all the way into adulthood to present day. Why Always history? Been my two favorites. Why history? History, I'm fascinated learning about our world in the past and how we have evolved until present day. Do you find history repeating itself as each mm -hmm. generation? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Each generation. I, and I find that as a history teacher, the more I study and more I teach about history, where history repeats itself constantly. Sad, isn't it? It is. Each generation has to relearn all the mistakes and learn from that, and hopefully the next generation, mm -hmm. well, you know. Yes. Yeah. When you graduated, where did you go to work? Worked in quite a few different areas. With the business degree, I worked in finance, worked at a credit union for a number of years, worked in the collection industry for a long time, uh, managed mm -hmm. a collection agency oh, for collection. several years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. debt collection, mm -hmm. um, worked for Fort Wayne newspapers for a number of years as well as a district manager, so we got into sales and marketing, so did a little bit of everything. Yeah, smorgasbord. That's right. You might say. And then eventually I decided to return to school um, some 12 years later after graduating with my business degree. Oh, yeah. Decided to pursue teaching. So I was age 41 when I returned and, and um, did that to pursue my teaching degree. When you became interested in America's history, uh, what prompted you to uh, want to learn about it? Just this interest in 
how we evolve as a society. Right. What do you I, I get asked often, what is my favorite era of history? And I teach both world and U.S. history. It's hard to pinpoint oh. down one or two because oh. I have so many areas that interest me. Yes. But I will say one of the top two or three eras of in, uh, history that has interested me the most throughout the years has been the Civil Rights Movement. Oh, wow. In the early 60s, what came to a head? What happened in the southern states? In the early 60s, there was a sit-in movement that was taking place primarily in southern states where blacks were not allowed to eat in certain restaurants, or if they were, they were segregated to certain sections. They were not allowed to sit at the front lunch counter. So there was a peaceful, nonviolent sit-in movement that challenged uh, those rules and those laws throughout a number of southern states. They also uh, pursued freedom rights, and that was to try and overturn segregated uh, buses and bus terminals, having uh, whites and blacks ride together on different uh, buses throughout the South to challenge uh, those Jim Crow laws as well. I, I can't understand why that all came to be, segregation. Mm -hmm. um, did that happen here in Fort Wayne, Indiana? Yes, actually. And that surprised me when I researched my book because I had believed that the majority of segregation and discrimination at that level happened only in southern states. Mm -hmm. And throughout my research, I learned that was not exactly the case. We had a lot of the same battles right here in the Midwest that were existing in the South. We had segregated restaurants here. We had hotels that refused to serve blacks. Um, we had segregating seating in movie theaters, restaurants, a number of other public facilities. And this was throughout the heart of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, where we had local activists who sought to change those policies. The leaders of the civil rights before Martin Luther King, do you know who they were? Uh, Two of the most prominent would be W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. I've heard of Washington, yes. Marcus Garvey could be another one that um, I would add to that group. And uh, what year did Martin Luther King Jr. become involved with the Civil Rights Movement? Okay. That was during the mid-1950s, and mm. he became active in the Civil Rights Movement following Rosa Parks. Oh, Rosa Yep. Yes. story most of us know were Rosa Parks, a uh, black woman living in Alabama. At that time, there was segregating seating on the bus lines. Mm -hmm. Blacks were allowed to sit up front in the bus until a white came in, and then by law, they were required to move to the back of the bus. Uh. Rosa Parks one day refused to do so. She was arrested. She was booked. Martin Luther King heard her story, talked to her, and organized the Montgomery bus boycott because the majority of uh, citizens who rode the bus were black. Mm -hmm. So Martin Luther King realized that if they boycotted and they refused to use the buses, that the buses were going to go bankrupt and they would right. be forced to change the laws. So it lasted about a year, mm -hmm. but that, um, that campaign was successful and the laws were changed. How did Martin Luther King try to spread peace and equality in the um, through peaceful, nonviolent resistance, um, Martin Luther King held in high regard Mahatma Gandhi and his peaceful efforts to, oh, to battle British colonialism in his country of India. And that heavily influenced Martin Luther King because racism and discrimination was so prevalent and so dominant, especially in the Jim Crow South, if blacks would become the slightest bit physical or the slightest bit vocal in their opposition, right. um, things were going to get nasty in a hurry, and he knew that. So that peaceful approach was something that he pushed constantly, that peaceful, passive resistance. And he also did that to help earn the respect of the white community, who might have been on the fence about whether or not changing some of these segregation laws were a good idea. Part of his goal also is that if the white community saw that they were acting respectfully, dressed nice, not engaged in any sort of violence whatsoever, and then having violent acts perpetrated towards them without any sort of provocation, that 
that approach would um, would encourage a lot of whites to get behind the movement as well. Just like that phrase, don't I bleed like others? Don't I eat like others? Don't I get sad like others? We're all human, one race. Mm -hmm. We're not separate from each other. Mm -hmm. And the Lord himself made us as one race. Uh, what was that uh, final thing that led Martin Luther King to say and speak his famous speech? Mm -hmm. Is that the I Have a Dream speech that you're referring to? Yes. Yes. And that was in Washington, D.C., during the March on Washington in August of 1963. Mm -hmm. And what I have learned is that he... He started to jot down some notes about the type of speech he was going to give that day. Mm -hmm. Had a few ideas, and he literally did have a dream and had um, sort of a grand vision, if you will, of what a more utopian, more equal society would look like. And while he's in the middle of giving this speech, you can actually even hear somebody in the background telling him, Martin, tell them about the dream. And then he moves into the eye of a dream portion of oh. that speech. And that speech is what Dr. King is most known for. Mm -hmm. And that's where the title of my book comes from. I call it Before the Dream, because he visited Fort Wayne just a little over two months before the March on Washington and before he gave the I Have a Dream speech. So that's where my title comes from. In this book, Before the Dream, there are several different uh, pictures of the community, the, the black community here in Fort Wayne and its history. So let's start explaining what these pictures are and all about them and all. Yes, I'd be happy to. This picture right here shows Dr. King when he was landing at the airport. It's Martin Luther King right here. This here is Dr. Ralph Abernathy, kind of his right-hand man throughout mm -hmm. the years. And he is being welcomed by this gentleman right here. And that is Reverend Clive Adams. Oh. Longtime pastor here in Fort Wayne and civil rights advocate. He and Dr. King were friends, and he was the one who was most instrumental leading the charge to invite him to Fort Wayne. Over on the far left, this is John Knuckles, who was the first black elected to Fort Wayne City Council, and he served more than 20 years Good. until his death in the early 1980s. Let's be sad. Uh, beside it, this is a picture after doc, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, oh. and this was a rally in downtown Fort Wayne, and this is actually right in front of the courthouse facing Main Street. Oh. There was an estimated 3,000 people in attendance, oh. and this was a nationwide memorial service called for by President Lyndon B. Johnson, and that was the Fort Wayne Memorial Service. And what's the others? Now, when Dr. King gave his speech in Fort Wayne, some were not particularly thrilled that he was here. And as you might see in this bottom picture, this was a group of protesters that was outside the Scottish Rite Auditorium, mm. and they were not in favor of his appearance. And you might see picket signs that they were holding up. In addition to that, there were numerous bomb threats that were called into the Scottish Rite that said if Dr. King gives his speech, they were going to blow up the building. Wow. So that got the FBI involved, as well as the attention of local officials and local law enforcement. In addition to that, as people were filing into the Scottish Rite, police became nervous about an out of town or a vehicle with out of town plates mm -hmm. and a Confederate flag on the back that continued to circle the building and didn't uh -huh. seem to be stopping. So thankfully, nothing violent happened, but the police department was on high alert. Picture up here at the top was taken shortly before his speech. There's Dr. King here, Ralph Abernathy again. Over on this side here is Dr. Alan Wilson, and he was a black dentist in Fort Wayne. I know that guy, mm -hmm. Alan. Alan Wilson? Wilson, yes, yes I heard of him. And over in the far left, this is Dr. LaVon Scott, who is the first black principal in Fort Wayne. And there is now a school in Fort Wayne named in his honor, the LaVon Scott Academy. Ooh, cool. Wow. One more photograph I would like to show you is this one here. And this is Reverend Jesse White. 
and he was a longtime civil rights advocate, also Baptist minister in Fort Wayne, and he was part of the group who also invited Dr. Martin Luther King to Fort Wayne, civil rights advocate long into the 60s, 70s, and 1980s. Mm -hmm. And one final photograph I'd like to show you. This gentleman here, this is Reverend John Meister, and at the time, he was the lead pastor at First Presbyterian Church downtown, and he was heavily in favor of the civil rights movement and racial equality, and I had the opportunity to interview both of his sons, who told me that any time a prospective white family came to talk to him about joining First Presbyterian Church, one of the first questions he asked them is, he said, do you have a problem with a biracial congregation? And if the family responded, well, not sure, I've never really been a part of a church with black families, don't know if I'd be comfortable or not, he told them, well, I'm sorry, this isn't the church for you, you need to find another church. If they indicated they had no problem with that, he would welcome them. Oh. This here, that's a picture of Dr. King on the stage at the Scottish Rite giving his speech here in Fort Wayne in June of 1963. That's a close-up photo down below. And I know the one beside him. <laughs> Didn't like him. On this side here, this is George Wallace, governor at Alabama, strong segregationist, later a presidential candidate. He gave a speech here in Fort Wayne one year after Dr. King, and his speech was heavily protested by a group of seminarians, Aha. which we see in this photograph right here, who were opposed to his appearance in Fort Wayne. Is this Concordia? Concordia Seminary, that's correct. This photograph up here, the upper left-hand corner, this is Paul Helmke. He was the mayor of Fort Wayne in the late 1980s and all of the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, he was my very first interview for this book because he was in attendance. He was good friends with Reverend Meister's brothers. Um, they invited um, Mr. Helmke to the speech. He was a high school freshman at the time. And he showed me uh, during our Zoom interview he has a picture um, encased of a ticket that he bought that night that Martin Luther King signed for him. And wow. He considers that one of his most prized possessions. And so this future yeah. three-term mayor um, was my first interview, and he's the one who put me in touch with several other people. Now, so. finally, the last picture on the right, mm -hmm. that's where he... Martin Luther King was assassinated? That's correct. That's the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, outside of room 306. This wreath always sits there, and this is now the home of the National Civil Rights Museum. Wow. Down here in this photograph, this is his son. That's Martin Luther King III. And this is a picture in front of the Martin Luther King Bridge in downtown Fort Wayne before a speech that he gave there and later at the embassy. That was just a few years ago. What happened after that, the, the speech? Uh, was there an uprising or was there people trying to be at peace with each other? Mm -hmm. What kind of reaction? Um, interestingly enough, um, during the March on Washington, this is when John F. Kennedy was our president. And Dr. King and his staff met with President Kennedy and several cabinet members, including his brother Bobby Kennedy, who was the attorney general at the time. And they were deeply concerned that it was going to become a violent gathering mm -hmm. just because of the massive crowd that was expected. And there was. There was um, in excess of 200,000 people there. Wow. There were no acts of violence whatsoever, absolutely oh, thank none. God. And interestingly enough, it was only um, roughly one month later mm -hmm. that there was a horrendous violent act in the South, where four little black girls were killed um, at a church bombing, and the Ku Klux Klan oh. claimed responsibility for that bombing. Inhumane. That was only one month later. How inhumane Ku Klux Klan is. Mm -hmm. Has there been any improvements since his uh, speech? It's been 60 years now, anniversary mm -hmm. of this I Have a Dream speech. Any improvement? In the society. Oh, 
Without a doubt. Without a doubt, um, during, during those 60 years, we have seen enormous improvements in equal opportunity and in um, just better opportunities for people of all races and racism being not quite as prevalent as it was then. I think, uh, um, probably, I think we've seen tremendous improvement, but we still have a lot of work to do. Still got a mm -hmm. long way to go. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we've seen a bit of a renaissance of racism in the last half dozen mm -hmm. years because the most recent president um, was quite vocal about how he feels about racial issues, and I think that's kind of stirred the pot. So that's that's something that I find quite troubling. So yeah. I think we've kind of taken a step back in race relations. You know, yeah. so do you find the world watching us? Yes. Especially being the world's lone superpower, um, as Americans, I think we have a responsibility to set the agenda, to set a good example for the rest of the world to follow. Sometimes we do a good job in that area, sometimes not so good. So I, I think I'm um, still a work in progress. We still stumble, but we're forging ahead. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so since this is the 60th anniversary of the speech, I have a dream. What celebrations is Fort Wayne doing to celebrate his speech? Mm -hmm. I have been made aware of a couple celebrations that will take place downtown. There's going to be a, a River Drum Festival, I believe it's called. Oh. Yes. And um, there is also a statue of Dr. King that is going to be built near the auditorium where he gave a speech, was known as the Scottish Rite at that time. Now it's the Goldstein Center. Yeah. And there is a statue commemorating his speech that he gave in Fort Wayne that will hopefully be unveiled at that time. I'd like to know uh, about Calhoun Street. Is, it, is that going to be changed? I hope so. I've been changed helping to lead what? that campaign for the last couple years where we seek to rename Calhoun Street after Martin Luther King. Um, John Calhoun was one of our earliest vice presidents. He was not only a slave owner, but he has been quoted on numerous occasions saying on the floor of the Senate that slavery was a wonderful institution, that it Say was good what? not just for slave owners, but also for slaves, okay. and thought it should continue indefinitely. Um, in addition to that, he was, all instru he was also instrumental in co-authoring the Indian Removal Act and moving oh. Native American tribes off their lands into Oklahoma. Yet we honor him here in Fort Wayne with one of our most prominent downtown streets. We think that should change. On top of that, he has no ties to Fort Wayne. He never even set foot in Fort Wayne. Oh. The only reason the street is named after him is he was an early supporter of the Wabash Erie Canal. Mm -hmm. We think the time has, been, has come and is long overdue to change that name and honor Dr. Martin Luther King instead. So we've been involved in that campaign for, for about two years now, and we're moving forward. And Kikianga, which we call Fort Wayne, people are hoping that it will be put back to the name Kikianga. So uh, what would you... I have a book here that you have sent to me, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could autograph it. I'd be happy to. This old girl. Um, <laughs> I have... <laughs> this old girl. Well, I am 71 in May. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to sign it. Okay. What are you writing? Does it work? <laughs> I think it does. There we go. <laughs> What are you saying? What are you saying? Two pate and Bob? <laughs> you writing a story? <laughs> a quote. <laughs> <laughs> Merciful heavens. That it's gel so that it dry off. Anytime I autograph my book for somebody, I always like to include a quote from Dr. King. Mm -hmm. So the one that I have included here is one of my favorites, and it says, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yes. So I've included that quote. 
Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Anyways, this is marvelous. And uh, what do you, what will Martin Luther King Club this year be doing besides celebrating his speech, I Have a Dream? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Um, we're, we're basically going to be participating with some of the downtown events that we alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. So we'll be part of the celebration, especially with the statue that's unveiled downtown um, and some of the other events and continuing the push forward with our renamed Calhoun Street campaign as well. Would there be like little events here and there besides the, uh, the statue and all? You'd be doing separate? Um, I'm not certain at this point that is something that we are discussing. Mm -hmm. So we will certainly have a presence downtown. Well, with our River Drums that I'm artistic director of, we are putting on a tribute to Martin Luther King and his 60th anniversary of I Have a Dream speech. We'll be trying to uh, get as many people to come be a part of us. In the beginning of our event, it goes from 5 to 11 at Promenade Park downtown Fort Wayne. And it will be on Tuesday, June the 6th. We do hope to see you there because it's going to be humdinger. We're going to be celebrating diversity, cultural uh, differences, and yet be as one as one community. So, what would you like to share with my audience, Chris, giving them hope about the future? We have certainly made a great deal of progress in the area of racial equality since the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s. You've noticed um, in numerous cases, blacks have made advances in business and politics, and that's nice to see. But we still have a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of racial differences, a number of cases of discrimination that we see, mm. some which are well publicized, and that needs to be addressed and solved. So we've made progress, but there's still a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. Do you find the younger generation starting to become more aware mm -hmm. and becoming more solid with our brothers and sisters? Here? Yes. Yes, that's a great question. As a high school teacher, where I work with teenagers every day, I see multiple examples where I believe this younger generation is much more open-minded and much more just much more open and much more accepting of different races and being more unified than previous generations. And that's that's really inspiring to watch. So we are going to be having, like I said, River Drums in June 6th. And I have invited Chris Elliott to be a vendor selling his books before the dream there at in the Pavilion of the Promenade Park. So thank you, thank you for coming on to my show, Chris. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And God bless, man. And we'll see you next week. Catch you later. always for the rest of all our